Hello, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Traders Summit. And with me today is the one and only Chris Weston from Pepperstone Securities, head of research over there. How's it going down under? Mate, we had an earthquake yesterday. So uh, we're still just waiting for the aftershocks. And we're something that's pretty rare around here. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in Melbourne at the moment with, uh, with lockdowns and people protesting and then, you know, earthquakes sort of making it into the run. So yeah, life's, uh, life's pretty interesting at the moment, Blake. That is wild. And so, you know, earthquakes, for, for those people that don't know, earthquakes aren't something that you deal with all the time in Australia, are they? No, they're not. I've been in Australia 20 years and I've, ne I've not personally ever felt one, to be honest, which is why when I was sitting in there looking at my white wall and and then, you know, the room started shaking and, you know, luckily I don't have any books on the side, but yeah, I was just like, is that me? And I, my dog started whining. I was like, no, no, it's definitely not me. So yeah, it was. Oh my, um, oh my gosh. So <laughs> that, that is, uh, well, let's just say strange days everywhere. And, and maybe one of the yeah. strangest days in the market here is that we've got we got we got a Fed Chairman Powell today, and I, you know I'm sure you you you're getting caught up, and you probably watched some of the price action following the FOMC, yeah. but he, he seemed a little bit hawkish. And uh, what stood out to you today? Because I was thinking, I was like, did he just say that? And I, you know, we're all whipping out our calculators, thinking, uh, what does that actually mean? Middle of 2022, wrapped up, wrapping up tapering. What does this all mean to you? What happened today? Well, I think, look, to be honest, I think that yeah, the, on a net basis, it was it was modestly hawkish. Um, but you know, if you if you're dovish and you're bearish in markets, and I suppose if you're dovish and, and, and you're looking at the statement, there's probably something in there for you. If you if you if you're sitting on the hawkish side of things, thinking the Fed needs to normalise more, more more effectively, more quickly, um, you probably had something in there. De well, you definitely had something in there for you as well. So you can slice and dice this, but obviously the market is the final arbiter of, of, of the news. And, you know, the initial reaction was to sell dollars. I don't, you know, you can make a guess that perhaps some people had positioned for a September taper. I think, you know, the Fed have done a pretty good job uh, in, in rounding people up into that, into that November camp. Um, so there will be no surprises once we get a, a, a reasonable uh, payrolls number on the 7th of October, that, you know, it is a lock on that we'll get that November height, unless we obviously see a big barrage of, of, of long term volatility leading into that. Um, but yeah, I think that on a net basis, you know, we suddenly saw the dollar, you know, dollar go bid, um, dollar index has moved up reasonably nicely, we saw the belly of the curve sell off. So five, five year treasuries moved up about eight basis points. Uh, the back end really didn't do much, but I suppose that's because inflation or break even rates moved a little bit lower, which meant that real rates moved, moved lower as well. Uh, so it moved higher. And, and you know, I think that sort of weighed on the nominal, the, the long end. Um, but yeah, I mean, the dollar's gone bid and gold's gone down and, and, and equities just continue to go higher, really. I think, you know, there, there's a nice bid going through in energy and financials. So look, I think it's a really interesting one. I mean, you can take out the fact that that they're going to probably taper in November and the pace is going to be faster than one market was looking for. You can look at the dots plots. And, you know, you look at it relative to market pricing, you know, we've got this 9-9 split for, um, for hikes next year, taking the rate up to 30 basis points. The mark, market's priced around 22. Uh, you go out to 23, 2023, you know, they're calling the Fed funds rate. The medium estimate there is 1%. Uh, the market's something like 72 basis points priced. Uh, you go out to, to 2024, we've got the dot for the first time. And they're calling for 1.8 percent. Now I'm not sure if the market was really the street was looking for those kind of levels. Um, but to give you context, if you look at swap rates at the moment, they're pricing in um, the Fed funds rate at that time by by 106. So there is a big divergence. I mean, we did see a bit of sell off in the rates market, but there's still this huge divergence playing through, which suggests that the Fed are on the money, and that's a big if. Then um, yeah, there's a, a, a big sort of catch up trade that needs to happen. So generally, that that should be considered US dollar positive. The pace of QE um, and that taper program uh, is probably it seems to be fairly punchy. Again, uh, probably somewhat dollar positive there as well. All right. Well, that's yeah. You know, let's let's see if the dollar will continue. And and it's going to be interesting to watch uh, with equities still re still maintaining a pretty good bid. 
but the dollar at the same time maintaining a bit of a bid as well. So I, I want to turn I want to turn our attention really to uh, you know what's happening in China since. You're in Australia. You're you you you're probably a little bit more sensitive to the to the the Evergrande situation and what's happening in in China real estate. What's your take on that, and and how's that going to affect the markets? Because obviously here in North America and worldwide, everybody's got their eyes really focused over there and their attention focused over there. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, I, I, as I as I say this right now, they're they're due to make uh, two coupon payments today. They've made it clear that they're going to pay the onshore coupon payment about 36 million US dollars. It's the offshore borrowers, uh, which we, you know, by the time everyone watches this, we'll probably know the know the story. But there's a bit of angst that the offshore borrowers, the international borrowing community or lenders, um, you know, might not get their coupon the 86 million. And I think that tells you a great story. I mean, it tells you one thing here: that domestic confidence is absolutely key for the Chinese here. Next October. We're going to see the 20th party conference. This is where Xi Jinping potentially can get a third term. Um, It's really, really rare in China for for leaders like that to get a third term. So this is unprecedented territory almost. Um, And what he will want to make sure is that domestic confidence is shored up and strong going into that. A property crash and an economic crash because property is 30 percent of GDP in, in China is not going to help that situation. So he needs to do everything within the powers and within the regulatory framework and the, and the various authorities to make sure that domestic um, uh, domestic confidence is good. And, you know, we've seen pictures of people lining outside property developers headquarters, um, you know, looking for their money, protesting, you know, getting very, very an- anxious about their, their savings. And that is not a good look ahead of that party conference. So they will do everything to make sure that that, that those projects are ring fenced and supported by state owned enterprise and also by uh, local governments. The actual debt itself will probably need to be restructured within Evergrande. Um, and, you know, if you look at the way the bonds are trading, Evergrande's bonds, it, the markets are expecting something back, but obviously they've repriced significantly. So the question is, is, is can they look after the um, you know, domestic confidence? Can they look after suppliers um, and, and, and try and ring fence those issues? Um, so there will be some, some, some angst amongst the property stocks. There has been, there will probably continue to be so. And deleveraging the situation is not without risk. So, of course, we are watching this pretty closely. But ultimately, you know, they'll, they'll try everything to make sure that domestic confidence is, is really important. For us as traders, I mean, obviously, everyone's watching the property sector. Everyone's watching the, the, C, the A50 futures, the Hang Seng. Um, but I also like to watch dollar c and I think the, the offshore yuan is a really important one there as well. Um, you know, not just because, you know, if you see strength in the yuan, the CNH, you tend to see strength in the Australian dollar as well. And we take our cues from that and the variance between the two picks up and we see stronger correlations. So, yeah, I think for people out there who are trading the Kiwi, the Antipodean currencies, yeah, do keep an eye on dollar CNH because if that, if that sort of moves higher and do, the dollar goes bid um, until we break out through back above 650 again, then, yeah, that's going to weigh back on Aussie dollar, Kiwi dollar, um, you know, and, and, and take that down. Obviously, if we see that reverse dollar goes down against the CNH, then, then you know, obviously that's going to have a, a reverse effect on the Aussie dollar. So, yeah, I think that's a, probably a good one to watch uh, in the short term there. That's, you know, th- those are some great and very valid points, Chris. And as far as the US dollar CNH, something that, uh, you know, I've been watching very carefully myself, and I know uh, Brent Donnelly over at Spectrum Markets, he's been looking at it as well. And I, and I think you, you bring up the perfect level, 650, 652, somewhere around there. If we start getting above that, that might, uh, that might be, you know, a worrisome situation with, you know, what the dollar might do against some other currencies. But I, w- I wanted to leave you with, or just ask you one last question. And I think you've answered it for the most part because of the Chinese elections coming up this next year. You know, is this ever grand situation? Is it a, you know, is it a singular type of situation, or is it a, a more of a byproduct of a bigger, maybe systematic, you know, issue, you know, in, in China? And that, and and I, I, I understand where your your point of view is, but I guess you know, based on what you're seeing, do you think this is a one off or not? Well, it hasn't been a one-off because um, you know there's a lot of other property companies that have been getting smashed in this whole situation. And you good know, point. Uh, you know, Evergrande w- make up a percentage of the the high yield credit index, a, a large percentage of that. But there are obviously a lot of other companies that have that have over leveraged and, and and built way too much property that they're still in the middle of, of, of 
going through. And of course, last year we saw the free red lines, you know, trying to you know limit the the amount of leverage and you know telling people that property is not for speculating, it's for living in. And and you know, I think since that time there has been you know this 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 look at basically the the leverage that's in, involved in that. And there will have to be restructurings playing through, and the extent of that restructuring uh, will impact the financial system in terms of their non-performing loans. Um, if Evergrande was to default, yeah, I mean, and, and, and depending on what that looks like, yeah, that's going to weigh on the financial sector to an extent and their non-performing loans to say will be down, but not, not to any kind of catastrophe, you know, bad levels. Yeah. Um, but if it was to really sweep across the finan- uh, the, the property space, then yeah, obviously we look at, start looking at the, the contagion effect. So we go back to 2008 type situations. We're not looking at collateral as you know, loan obligations, but we're going to be looking at credit default swaps across you know, the whole Asian banking space and see if they start widening substantially. And then that will be you know, the, the cue then that we're going to start seeing contagion risks playing through and you know, volatility playing up to a higher regime in, in financial markets. At the moment, we're not there. Um, but that's the concern that we have is, is the extent of the downgrade across the property spectrum. What does that mean for non-performing loans in the banks? And ultimately, what then you know, you're going to see that reverberated in some of these bets that people take out for protection, like credit default swaps. And I think for us as currency traders and, and traders more broadly, yeah, if we can look at that and see a widening of that, then we can we can trade volatility. We can obviously take our pick on, on what currencies we like to do in, in a risk-off scenario, such as the yen, the Swiss franc. So I think, yeah, we've got our we I think more importantly in this, it's a very complicated situation for a lot of retail traders to do. You've got to recognise the cues. Like we're looking at credit default swaps, uh, market pricing more broadly, uh, and then when that starts to move, um, you know, we can start reacting. And I think in this situation, reacting will probably be key. Well, you know, Chris, I, I appreciate your your comments and your feedback and your thoughts and ideas. And I know all of our traders back that are that are watching this right now on the Trader Summit. Uh, community really appreciate it as well. And I want to say, you know, being a partner with Pepperstone Securities over the years, it's been really a pleasure of mine and uh, and the Forex analytics community. Uh, uh, but really with Trader Summit, we enjoy your analysis coming in. And uh, and I know for, 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 for more analysis from Chris, make sure you read his columns that he puts up from time to time on the Trader Summit site. You can get to Chris Weston and Pepperstone Securities in the link in the description of this video. Chris, thanks so much for joining me. And I know it's it's always hard for us. We're like two ships passing in the night. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but being able to talk from time to time on Trader Summit, I love it. And I'm glad that you're here. And thanks so much for being with us today. Mate, you're uh, you're killing it at the moment. Some of the guests you're getting on, it's uh, it's, 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 it's next rate. You're a, you're a premium, uh, premium portal these days. So yeah, good work. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, next time we next time we meet, let's uh, get rid of that uh, New York Giants uh football helmet will you all right <laughs> oh, mate, i'm a 49ers fan mate i'm a 49ers fan it's just i went to vegas one year and on bucks do and and it just so happened to purchase that yeah we so love it anyway we're just i'm just like i just like to harass you all right chris thanks again for joining us we'll talk to you soon cheers blake thanks man